Hello and welcome back to another video on A-Level Law Revision. So this one's going to be a non-fatal offences uh, against the person revision video. So we're going to have a look through the different offences that you need to know for the specification in the exam. So one of the first offences that you do need to know is assault. Um, and this is defined in common law. The case of Collins v. Wilcock actually gives us a definition. And it is charged under section 39 of the Criminal Justice Act. A massive mistake, people there, which people will mention that it's or say it's been defined under the Criminal Justice Act. It wasn't, it was actually defined in common law. You won't find a definition if you go to section 39 of the Criminal Justice Act. So you've got to be really careful there. Um, it's a summary offence, which, which means it's tried in the magistrate's court, and the maximum sentence is six months. The actus reus in the mens rea, you can see in the middle bit there of the slide, so intentionally or recklessly, that's the mens rea part causing the victim to apprehend the infliction of immediate unlawful force. That is a slightly um, adapted um, actus reus, particularly there. The actual traditional definition uses the word violence and things like that. So we've actually just taken that and sort of simplified it slightly to actually what it is to make it more sense in terms of the law. Uh, three cases that tell us a bit more information about what can class as um, sort of an assault. And just essentially the easiest way to remember it is it is just a threat. Um, you don't actually have to hit anybody or do any, or apply any force. It's simply a threat of doing so. Um, so in Mead, we saw that words and singing uh, can certainly be seen uh, as sufficient to be a threat. Uh, we saw that silent telephone calls in Ireland uh, were sufficient, um, again, to be the, an assault, a, a threat, uh, and Constanza threatening letters as well. So in each of those cases, the question was whether did those actions cause the victim to think or apprehend the infliction of immediate unlawful force that they think they were going to have force applied to them there and then. Um, some issues there potentially with Ireland Constanza, but we'll come back to those later on. Uh, but, but generally you can see you know, the victim would have felt frightened at that, that moment or felt like someone was going to apply unlawful force towards them. Furthermore, with assault, uh, there's a couple of more cases. So log doing, it's all about what the victim thinks. So in that, ca in that case, uh, someone opened a drawer with a gun. Now the, the defendant in that case said, well, I couldn't have shot him because there wasn't any ammo in the gun. But of course the victim didn't know that. So the victim did apprehend the infliction of immediate unlawful force. In Arabiki, uh, the victim knew it wasn't possible in this one. They were on the train and the, the, it was, the train was leaving and the person was on the platform. Um, there was no way that that person would be able to apply uh, unlawful force against them. So, um, and the victim knew that, so the victim hadn't been assaulted. Uh, equally in Tipperville v Savage or Savage, um, the words negated the assault. You know, what he said was essentially, I would assault you, but I'm not going to. So in that case, the victim knows it's not going to happen. So they've not been assaulted. They don't apprehend the infliction of immediate unlawful force. Uh, and Smith v Chief Constable of Woking Police Station uh, looked at this. It was a sort of peeping Tom case. Uh, he obviously had a good defence counsel because they said, well, he was outside the window peering in and they said, well, he couldn't immediately apply unlawful force because he'd have to get into the house first. So the court sort of adapted the wording and said, well, imminent is sufficient. You know, it doesn't have to be immediate and imminent is probably slightly along the line there. Still soon, um, but not quite as soon as immediate, but that would be sufficient. So uh, that case was still assault. In terms of the mens rea, as we said earlier, it's intentionally or recklessly causing the victim to apprehend the infliction of immediate unlawful force. One mistake a lot of people do in this, when they're writing this, they just say the mens rea is intentionally or recklessly. And the question mark there is, well, intentionally or recklessly doing what? So it's important that you say intentionally or recklessly causing the victim to apprehend the infliction of immediate unlawful force. That's what you have to intend or be reckless about. Um, in terms of what intention and recklessness mean, we know from the case of Mohan that intention is the idea, it's a decision to bring about a prohibited consequence. So you're deciding to do an offence, that's sort of uh, the intention there. We know recklessness from the case of Cunningham, uh, the gas meter case, uh, knowing, it's knowing that there's a risk and deciding to take it. So some differences there, and you can sort of work that out um, in, in the scenario uh, if an assault comes up. Generally, most assaults are done intentionally as part of like a fight or for some reason like that, you can see from their actions. Um, quite difficult to do a reckless assault. One of the common sort of examples is maybe something, someone putting like on a clown mask and they know someone's scared of clowns. So their intention is to frighten them. Do they know there's a risk that that person could apprehend the infliction of immediate unlawful force and think they're going to be assaulted, attacked? Maybe it's not their intention, but possibly they're reckless there. So a bit of a strange example, but something that maybe uh, could sort of be the reckless part. In terms of battery, uh, it's very similar. So the first bits are identical to assault, really. So it's defined in common law, same case, Collins v Wilcock, charged under Section 39 of the Criminal Justice Act. Again, careful to say it's defined in common law, not Section 39 of the Criminal Justice Act. Uh, same, so it's summary uh, and a maximum six-month sentence as well. 
This one's generally easier, it's a shorter actor's rare, so generally it's easier to remember, so intentionally or recklessly, so same man's rare as assault, but this one, applying unlawful force. So most commonly people talk about assaults as this, uh, actually being hit by somebody, uh, but the actual being hit by something, the actual force being applied is actually a, a battery. We know from Collins v. Walcock, which is the same case as one above, uh, it's the slightest touch. You know, in that case, he, a policeman grabbed a prostitute's arm, didn't have to be violent, the slightest touch is enough. So it certainly doesn't have to be a punch or a slap, although that would more commonly be obviously seen as a battery. It could simply be putting a finger on someone else's shoulder or a hand on someone else's shoulder or on the back. That would be technically enough to be a battery. Whether it would be charged, you know, by the Crown Prosecution Service or not, by the police, is a different question, but technically under the law it could be. Thomas, we saw that touching clothes is sufficient. He sort of uh, rubbed the hem of, um, uh, a lady's dress in that one, and that was sufficient to be a battery. It doesn't have to be touching someone's skin or punching them or anything like that, as we said. Uh, but bear in mind that ordinary jostings of everyday life, from the case of Wilson v Pringle, would not be a battery. So bumping into someone on the train or on the tube or on the bus or in, in a corridor at college or school, you know, that's not going to be um, uh, that's not going to be seen as a battery. It's just ordinary jostlings. Um, Santa Bermuda is a bit of a more of a rarer case. It was done through an omission, so he was stop and search. The police officer said, have you got anything on you? He said no, she put a hand in his pocket and there was a needle and it sort of obviously applied an awful force by, cut, by cutting a hand and going into a hand. Um, he didn't directly like stab her with a needle or anything like that, but he did apply an awful force by failing to say that it was in there. So a bit of a rarer case, quite difficult to come up I would say, but it's worth knowing in case it, in case it does. Uh, Martin and DPPVK both have the same sort of legal point of ratio there, so um, they both say that force can be applied indirectly. In Martin, he, shouted, he barred the theatre doors and shouted five, no, there wasn't a fire and people got injured. DPPVK put the acid in the hand dryer um, and obviously the acid then sprayed out at, at somebody. So um, in both of those cases, it's not the case of someone punching or slapping someone, it's a case of the force being applied through something else, uh, is that, and they would say that's indirectly. So this would include things like throwing a rock at someone, or um, slamming a door on someone, or you know those sort of things. Training a dog to jump on someone, in theory, could be the same. Um, those sort of things would still be applying force, even though you haven't physically done it with your hand or your leg, whatever. Um, Fagan, again, a bit of a strange case. Uh, the battery was, it says battery's a continuing act. Uh, in this case, the, the man accidentally drove onto a policeman's foot, but then refused to remove it, even though he knew it was on there. Um, now, strictly speaking, he didn't form the mens rea until after he'd done the actus reus. So if you know the principle of coincidence of actus reus and, and, men, coincidence of actus reus and mens rea, uh, if you don't understand that, it's worth looking at the video on intoxication, which covers that towards the end uh, that's on this channel. Um, they it, would, it wouldn't work essentially he wouldn't be guilty so they essentially said the actus reus is a continuing act so as long as the mens rea happens some point within that period of time which it did because he formed it afterwards uh when he decided not to remove the the, uh, the tire from the foot uh it was fine and he was convicted of it so really a public policy case there he was obviously in the wrong so they didn't want to let him get away with it based on a technicality uh, and the mens rea is exactly the same as assault, so it's worth knowing those definitions from Mohan and Cunningham as well in terms of what intentionally and recklessly mean. Um, and a reckless, just going back as well, a reckless battery might look something like swinging a bar around. You don't intend to hit someone with it, but uh, you know there's a risk you could hit someone with it and decide to take that risk anyway. So that would be a reckless uh, battery if you hit someone with it, you know, in theory, versus intentionally doing it. Um, watch out in for scenarios for batteries that occur without assaults. So if you sneak up on them or hit them in the dark, you know, those in those instances, there would be no assault. And that's worth mentioning that and saying, well, they, the person, the victim wouldn't have apprehended the infliction of immediate unlawful force. There'd be no assault. And also bear in mind that assault and battery can be combined into the offence of common assault. Uh, so that's worth uh, mentioning as well. In terms of ABH, it gets a bit more complicated now. Uh, ABH is actually defined in Section 47 of the Offences Against the Persons Act. Uh, which is a statute we'll sort of look at towards the end in terms of the essay, a very important essay and lots of criticism we can make of that. It's a trial either way offence, which means it can be tried in the magistrates uh, or the Crown Court, and there's obviously variations on that. There'll be another video on how that works uh, soon on the channel. Um, it's a maximum of five year sentence, um, so it's up significantly from obviously uh, assault and battery. Uh, and the actus reus is an assault or battery which occasions ABH. Now, occasions essentially means is, uh, means uh, causes. So, assault or battery which results or causes an ABH. 
Um, and the mens rea is intentionally or recklessly committing an assault or battery. So actually, we'll look at a minute how actually there isn't actually any extra mens rea for the ABH part. So essentially, you have to prove that an assault or battery happened and that resulted in some ABH. And we'll look at how, how that works in a second. So quite often it's seen as like an upgraded assault or battery or an aggravated assault and battery. Uh, because normally with an assault and battery, um, there's no actual harm caused. As soon as there's sort of minor harm falls, which is the general sort of definition of ABH, uh, you're looking at potentially an ABH uh, offence instead. So obviously it uses the term ABH there, and we'll talk in a minute uh, when we look at the criticisms about it being perhaps a circular definition. So don't worry about that yet, but I'll come to that. Uh, a case obviously has had to tell us actually because the statute doesn't tell us what ABH actually means so a case called Miller told us that it meant any harm calculated to interfere with the health or comfort of the victim um, so you know in essence you're looking at bruises scratches minor burns minor psychological harm which I'll come to in a minute um, sort of minor harm really broken nose is the absolute classic one or twisting an ankle or a wrist it's sort of where it's not super serious harm but it obviously is it does interfere with your health and comfort. Ireland specifically told us, and that's going back to the same case earlier with the silent telephone calls, that uh, psychiatric illness can count as ABH. So sort of minor psychological harm, so minor anxiety and minor depression could certainly be seen as ABH. And that's usually caused through an assault, through something like stalking or something like that. Uh, DPPV Smith, it's cutting off a ponytail, that was sufficient to be ABH. Um, you know, in terms of looking at the technicalities of that, does it interfere with your health or comfort? Not perhaps your physical health, but certainly in terms of your psychological health and the attachment you would have to your hair and things like that. Obviously, they took that very seriously. Uh, and TVDPP, uh, they said temporary loss of consciousness, so being knocked out essentially, is sufficient to be uh, ABH. Um, in terms of the mens rea, you do not need to prove that D foresaw, intended, or was reckless as to whether what they did caused ABH. Uh, so if we look at the case of Roberts, Dee's guilty uh, as he committed a battery and an assault, in that case probably, so he's liable for ABH. It didn't matter that he didn't intend the, intend the harm caused. This is where she chucked herself out of the vehicle and obviously bruised and injured herself. Um, even though he didn't even know it could happen potentially, it happened, tough luck. He did an assault or battery, that resulted in ABH. You do not have to prove any sort of mens rea link to the ABH. As long as they intended or recklessly did the assault or battery, if that's resulted in ABH, that is the answer. So when you're applying this, it's really important that you cover firstly, has there been an assault or battery? And you wanna make sure you cover the full act of mens rea for that. And then secondly, has that resulted in some minor harm? If the answer is yes, they're guilty of ABH, regardless of whether they intended it or foresaw the harm, that, that level of harm being caused. GBH section 20, so Offences Against the Person Act. Uh, it's a trial either way offence again, and same sentence there again, which will come to as potentially a problem. Now, the actus reus uh, in this one is wounding or inflicting grievous bodily harm. Uh, and the mens rea is intent to do some harm or reckless as to any harm caused. Now, this is where it's a bit interesting and complicated. The defendant can be charged with either wounding or inflicting GBH, not both. So they can either be charged with that first bit, wounding, the first bit of natus reus, or inflicting the GBH part. Now we saw in Eisenhower um, and Wood, or either, uh, that a wound is a break in the continuity of the skin, which means basically a cut that bleeds. So as soon as you've got a cut that bleeds, that's a break in the continuity of the skin, um, that is a wound. So the problem was in Eisenhower and Wood, in Eisenhower he was shot in the eye with a BB gun and it caused severe bruising around his eye, uh, but no break in the, continuity of the in continuity of the skin, there was no cut. So they charged him with wounding, but in that essence, they, he hadn't wounded him, so essentially he wasn't guilty. In Wood, he, the defendant broke the victim's collarbone. Again, there was no break in the continuity of the skin, it was all internal, obviously, um, and they charged him with wounding. And again, that was a mistake because that wasn't a wound. So you have to be really careful there as to whether it's a wound uh, or not. Is it, if it's a cut, it is a wound. In terms of Saunders, that case told us that GBH is serious harm. So in terms of the inflicting GBH, the doing the GBH part, that's doing serious harm. There's no need in this one to prove that there's been an assault or battery first, like with ABH. It's simply you go straight in, have they wounded or have they done serious harm? Um, and that's literally a judgment call in terms of the the you know the act, the outcome of what's happened, the result of what's happened. So you know a stab wound would essentially be both. It would be a break in continuity of the skin, and it would be cast as serious harm clearly. So they could be charged with either there. 
Um, the example of like, the broken collarbone, though, you know, it's not a wound, so that they would want to charge with inflicting GBH because a broken collarbone is very clearly serious harm. We have had a few cases that told us a bit more information. So we know that serious psychiatric harm or psychological harm uh, will be classed as serious harm. So that will count as GBH. Uh, we saw that from the case of Burstow, which is a serious stalking case. Um, we also know that the transfer or reckless transfer of biological diseases such as HIV um, can also be classed as uh, GBH or serious harm. And we saw that from the case of Dika. Uh, where his intention was to have sexual intercourse with the women. Uh, it, he knew there was a risk he could pass on HIV because he knew he was HIV positive and he decided to take that risk. So it was a, it was a reckless transfer of HIV. He didn't intend to give the, the ladies HIV, but um, he was reckless in, in doing so. So he was charged with Section 20 GBH. Finally, again, the harm can be indirect. It does not have to be directly inflicted. So in Lewis, uh, he was obviously shouting and trying to break down the door uh, of, he, of, the, of this woman. She decided to jump out the window uh, to escape him and broke both her legs uh, as a result. Uh, and he was found liable for causing uh, those obviously serious injuries and broken legs would be seen as serious injuries. Other things that might be classed as serious injury, you might be thinking serious burns, uh, severe loss of blood, being put in a coma, any broken bones generally, although not 100%, but broken bones generally would be seen, specifically if it's like a broken leg or any broken neck, absolutely, you know, those sort of things, fracture, uh, broken skull, uh, anything that would be classed as, you know, suitably serious, gunshot wounds, stab wounds, those sort of things, and then as we said, the psychological harm and things like that. Um, in terms of the mens rea, the mens rea is the main thing here that distinguishes section 20 from section 18. The actus reus actually is essentially the same for 18 or 20. So what you actually do, the stab wound, it could either be 20 or 18. The difference is the mens rea. So for section 20, uh, it's intent to do some harm or intent to do, or reckless as to whether any harm is caused. So, you know, if I stab, whereas section 18 is intent to do serious harm. So if I stab you, most people would argue that's intent to do serious harm. So that would be sufficient for section 18, essentially, because you've got GBH, you've got wound, which is the, the actus reus part for both. Um, and it's resulted in, um, and, you, and sorry, and you intended to do serious harm. So I always use the example of someone pushing someone over and they break their arm, broken arm potentially counted as a serious harm, so inflicting the GBH part. Uh, you probably didn't intend serious harm from doing that, but you intended some harm or you're reckless as to whether any harm was caused. Compare that to pushing someone down a steep flight of stairs and they break their arm. Well, you've again, you've caused, you've inflicted GBH serious harm because of the broken arm again. Um, and you probably intended serious harm in that instance. So that person would be charged with Section 18 instead. Section 18 of the Offences Against the Person Act covers the higher offence of GBH. It is indictable, so it's tried in the Crown Court. And the maximum sentence is discretionary life, which means the judge has a choice whether to give life or not or anything below. Uh, and you'll see the actus reus is almost identical, wounding or causing GBH here. But the courts have absolutely said that causing means exactly the same as inflicting in this instance. Now, we'll debate that later on in area three, but in this instance, it, it does. So actually, as I said earlier, the actus reus for 20 and 18 is identical. You have to either wound or do serious harm. And as you can see there, the mens rea is intent to do serious harm. Uh, same situation, they can be charged with either wounding or GBH, so you have to think about uh, the differences there. Um, and they have the same definition. So a wound, again, is a break in the continuity of the skin, and GBH means serious harm, as from Saunders as well. A couple of cases on here. Uh, Roe is obviously quite a new case, 2017, a couple of years ago now. Um, it was the first case to convict in this country for intentionally infecting uh, the victim or victims with HIV. So all other cases beforehand, had been the reckless transfer of uh, HIV. In this case, they were able to prove that he intended to do serious harm because he wanted to uh, infect other people with HIV. So it's worth looking at the difference between that and Dika. Uh, Morrison um, basically established the rule that if someone commits a section 20 GBH, uh, but that's combined with resisting arrest or attempting to prevent arrest or resist arrest, um, they'll upgrade it to section 18 and that is on the basis of sort of protecting police officers in the line of duty and things like that so uh, quite a niche case and but worth looking at and sort of worth being aware of in, in case uh, that comes up in the exam in terms of uh, essay points and sort of jumping off points for AO3 uh, first thing is uh, number one the offences against the person act OPA which is commonly shortened to is a was supposed to be a consolidating act at the time in 1861 so given that assault or battery uh, sort of two main offences that are mentioned as part of ABH as well, which is in OPA, 
why weren't they included? Because we know they're defined in common law. They're not found in OPA. Um, so it's a bit strange as to why they're not in there. And you can talk about the sort of problems with that uh, and issues and why perhaps, you know, a reforming act might include them um, from the Law Commission, you know, as a suggestion. Number two, OPA uses old language. So they talk about the words like grievous, wounding, felony. Uh, we don't particularly use those words necessarily anymore. So that can cause confusion for jurors, uh, magistrates perhaps, uh, and sort of lay people in terms of understanding and understanding the law as to what those terms really mean. You know, grievous bodily harm just means serious harm. So why not call it that? Why call it GBH still? Uh, OPA also refers to lots of old things. Uh, they refer to a particular chemical called laudanum, which uh, I might be pronouncing that horrifically, but that's a chemical we don't no longer we no longer use really. So it sort of references the use of that in a crime, and it's just not really applicable anymore. Also, offences against the person act contains uh, a lot of old offences that again no longer use. So impeding someone trying to escape a shipwreck, assaulting a clergyman, so that's like a priest. Uh, you know we don't use these offences anymore, so they need to be repealed really. And repealed, remember, means sort of uh, removed from the statute book. Overall, and this is one of the main points, number four, OPA is significantly outdated. It was written in 1861 and society was significantly different then. You know, we were long before women's rights, working rights, uh, working conditions were completely different. Society was completely different, technology and things like that. So in particular, phone calls, uh, they obviously made no reference to telephone calls or use of telephones in crimes uh, in 1861 because I'm pretty sure that was before the telephone was even existed, even existed or if it did, it was only in its infancy. Um, so, you know, the case of Ireland, the judges had to come along and say, well, what are we going to do in this instance? And they had to decide what the law was. Similar to HIV, um, you know, HIV certainly, as far as we're aware, didn't exist in the human population uh, in 1861, and not we're aware of. Um, so, again, you know, it didn't mention that. Uh, and their knowledge of sort of sexually transmitted diseases was very low anyway at that time, uh, which I think is probably fair to say in terms of the modern treatment we have of those and things like that. Uh, and psychological harm again, you know, they did have an awareness of psychological harm, absolutely. Uh, but their treatment again was very uh, old, old, you know, old fashioned really and harmful in many instances. Uh, so again, the judges had to step in and really cover that as to whether that is something that we want to criminalise today. So causing that sort of level of harm as they did in Ireland and Burstow. We also know, number five, there's a problem of circular definitions. So ABH and GBH, in both those definitions, uh, they use the terms ABH and GBH in the definition of what ABH and GBH is. So we call that a circular definition. It's like saying, well, what's an apple? And I'd say, well, it's a fruit like an apple. It's, you know, you, it doesn't tell you what an apple actually really is. Um, and because of that, judges have had to step in and to define what those terms mean. And there's issues there with pilot, uh, parliamentary supremacy, separation of powers, judge-made law and things like that. Uh, but they've had to provide a clearer definition. And the offences uh, in OPA are typical of Victorian legislation. They're very narrow, cover very specific things. We know most of the new uh, new law that's been passed in the last sort of 50 years generally encompasses broader offences. So theft, for instance, instead of having lots of narrow, different theft offences, the Theft Act went for one broad offence, which they've covered and covers, you know, a multitude of things. Number six, uh, what I call the paper cut problem, and what I think might be referred to as a paper cut problem by others, um, you know, the issue is, technically, if you paper cut someone and that caused a blood, you know, a cut, a break of the of the skin, that under the law is GBH. It's a wound, uh, as we know from Eisenhower and Wood. But of course, in reality, no one's going to be charged uh, with uh, GBH in that instance. You know, you'd be lucky to get a battery, you know, in, in really in terms of the CPS taking that seriously. Um, and there is a huge disjuncture or disparity between what the law actually says across most of these offences and then what actually is charged uh, by the CPS and the police, Crown Prosecution Service and the police. So one of the big questions here is, well, if they're not using the law, why don't we just change it to what actually they're, they're doing currently? Um, there are some issues with sentencing number seven. So we know ABH and GBH section 20 carries the same sentence, which doesn't make any sense when on the hierarchy we know that GBH section 20 is treated as more seriously. You're doing more serious harm. Um, and we'll say in a minute, the Law Commission have suggested changing that to seven years rather than five, you know, the GBH part to reflect that. Uh, the fact that ABH number eight requires no extra mens rea, so compared to assault and battery, uh, those we saw from Roberts, it's simply if you do an assault and battery and that results in some ABH, some minor harm, tough luck. Um, and there is some debate there as to whether that's fair. Uh, although, you know, the tough luck argument does fit fairly well there in terms of who shouldn't have been assaulting or doing a battery in, in the first place. Number nine, uh, there is a huge uh, misnomer uh, mis really in terms of the public perception of assault and battery. 
Uh, a lot of people would suggest that, you know, when there's been a battery, there's been an assault, or in fact, probably a common assault. Uh, and this dissimilarity in terms of, as I said earlier about the law and what the CPS charges uh, is an issue. And um, finally, number 10, uh, the fact that GBH section 20 and 18, the courts have told us that there's no difference in the actus reus, but actually we know section 20 uses the word inflict and section 18 uses the word cause. So if parliament used different words in 1861, surely they meant different things. Um, and there's some issues there as to well, whether you know, they do mean different things or not. And you can look more into that in terms of whether inflict would require uh, an assault or battery and whether cause wouldn't and things like that. So there's some nice reading you can do around that uh, and expand upon that. In terms of reform proposals, the Law Commission in 2013, you know, they said basically that it's widely recognised as being outdated. They said it's archaic language, means old language, old fashioned, Victorian approach of listing separate offences for individual factual scenarios, many of which are no longer necessary. So sort of echoing what we said there. Um, in 2015, they actually gave some specific, well, they did in 2013 as well, but in 2015, they gave some more specific suggestions of what to change. They suggest renaming assault and battery, battery to physical assault, assault to threatened assault, which would probably make more sense. Um, and in terms of uh, the 47, 20 and 18 sections, uh, they suggested renaming them in order there. So uh, you can see, so the section 18 would be the first one there, intentionally causing serious injury uh, with the maximum sentence of discretionary life in the same way. And that wording there, intentionally causing serious injury would fit much closer to what actually it is and get rid of that old language. Uh, you could see there the second one, recklessly causing serious injury, uh, would have a maximum sentence of seven years. Um, and if you look down to the final one, which would replace ABH essentially, intentionally or recklessly causing injury. Uh, now, obviously, you would have to have definitions of what was serious injury and what was just injury. Uh, but that language is much more common in terms of what we would speak today rather than the old fashioned terms. Finally, uh, just a couple of quotes from a couple of books here. You can see the uh, you can see the references down the bottom if you wanted to find these. Uh, Wilson, uh, William Wilson said, Oprah has enjoyed little in the way of critical acclaim, uh, and the case for reform is widely acknowledged as irresistible. Uh, and finally, from Reed and Fitzpatrick, uh, they said the 1861 Act was a consolidating statute into which a whole host of existing offences were placed without any rationalisation. So, uh, two academic. Uh, viewpoints really there on the sort of need for reform there uh, in terms of you know how OPA really uh, is outdated and uh, and as I said in need of reform. So finally in terms of scenarios uh, you obviously want to make sure you identify how many issues there are there should be two or three maybe more uh, obviously identify which offences have occurred there and that's the trick there is sort of working out whether it's been an assault a battery an ABH or one of the GBHs or, ha or a multitude of them Obviously, once you've established which ones you think it is, you'd then write out the AO1 for those offences, including any relevant cases, uh, and then obviously write out the AO2 paragraphs methodically, uh, one for each issue I would do, uh, looking through the structure of sort of like, well, here's the actus reus using that terminology, and here's the evidence as to why the actus reus is or isn't present, uh, followed by the mens rea, using that terminology of the mens rea in the question, uh, followed by the evidence um, of whether you think the mens rea is present or not, and then obviously concluding, uh, making sure you answer the question. So I hope you found that useful. Uh, that covers non-fatal offences. It's one of the bigger topics for uh, criminal law unit. Um, again, please subscribe if you've been enjoying these videos and like give a like to the video and use them as many times as you like uh, to help you revise these topics. Thank you very much.